We're just going to spend a brief moment uh, looking at Genesis 16, um, because we didn't get to it last week. But then we're going to spend the bulk of our time in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, And I'm only going to get through verse 14 of Genesis 17. And for the focus of 17, what I want to do is I want to look at the text and ask and answer two questions. What's a covenant and what's a covenant sign? Because this word covenant shows up 13 times uh, alone in Genesis 17, and it's one of the most important themes that runs from the beginning to the end of Scripture. So that's our plan for today. Let me just pray and ask God's help. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you've spoken to us through your word and through your son, Lord, that we're not left to crawl around in the darkness, but that you have come to rescue us, Lord. You've given us revelation and redemption. Help us to hear from your word this morning, Lord, that we might see you more clearly, Lord, worship you more wholeheartedly, Lord, and live for you more faithfully. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, as you remember, Genesis 15, we focused on the promises that God had made to Abraham and the fact that he sealed his promises to Abraham in a ceremony where he walked between these animal halves to signify to Abraham that I will fulfill my promises to you. I swear on my life. So Abraham is given then this ceremony that signifies to him that these promises surely will come to pass. And then Genesis 16 opens up with the promises still unfulfilled, yet there's a plan concocted to how they can fulfill these promises. So just after Abraham is given this assurance that the promises will be fulfilled, Genesis 16 opens up with their attempt to fulfill the plans themselves. So look at the first couple of verses with me in chapter 16. It says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. So we're reminded once again that the main obstacle to the promise still remains, that his wife, Sarah, has given him no children. He's promised many offspring, and he still has no offspring. But here's a possible solution. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So Sarah, who obviously knows about the promises that God had made to Abraham and the ceremony that he swore the promises to Abraham, still after hearing those and and having Abraham told those to her, thinks that, well, I'm I'm the problem, that if God's going to fulfill the promises, he's got to do it some other way because he can't do it through me. And so this is the plan she proposes to Abraham. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of his wife. Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, so he's been here 11 years now, 11 years since Genesis 12, and still no promises fulfilled. Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And there's interesting word usage in this passage because if you remember Genesis 3, When Eve ate from the tree of the Garden of Eden, what was the language used to describe the act of rebellion? It said she took of its fruit and gave to her husband who was standing there. And when God calls the covenant curse down on uh, Adam for rebelling, he says, because you listened to the voice of your wife. So here in Genesis 16, in words that echo Genesis 3, we have Abram listening to the voice of his wife, Sarah, who takes her Egyptian servant, Hagar, and gives her to her husband. And Abraham stands by passively listening to this plan of this futile attempt to fulfill the promises that God has just made. And I think these echoes are intentional. And what God is showing us is, once again, how potent sin is, how powerful it is, and how much it affects the human heart. Because there's a contrast in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, Eve sinned because the serpent coerced her. She had the serpent coercing and coaxing her to look at that fruit that was delightful to the eyes and maybe sweet to the mouth. Yet here in Genesis 16, there's no need for a serpent to coerce one into sin. That the human heart has gotten so wicked that it's even willing to walk down a path that God has not led them down without even the the serpent to conjure up the plan for them. That this is a plan that Sarah conjures up all by herself and Abram goes along with as well. But what's also important, I think, to see from Genesis 16 is that there's an encouragement here. 
Notice that God called Abram and his wife Sarah to be the recipients of this promise, to be the channel through who he fulfills this promise. And yet Genesis doesn't shrink back from showing us the people that God uses, their warts and all. That God clearly, Genesis 16 shows us, did not pick Abram and Sarah because they had superior intellect or a superior moral record. That what God is doing by using Abram and Sarah is she's showing how gracious and glorious he is. Because not only is God amazing in the promises he gives, but he's amazing in the people he uses to fulfill the very promises he gives. That he can use someone like Abram and Sarai, who still are so fickle in their faith and trust, to even believe the promises that God had just made a little bit ago in a ceremony, and try to fulfill the plans of their own, and yet God still uses them. So God is glorious not only in how he fulfills his promise, but in who he uses to fulfill them. And then jump down to the end of chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And we actually see that the plan that Sarah concocted and Abram followed is actually successful in in their eyes. It says, um, And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And then jump now to chapter 17. So we're just told Abram's 86 years old when this child is born. And there's no indication yet that God has kind of jumped in and said that the plan you're trying to concoct is not part of my plan. And then chapter 17, verse 1, we jump in and it says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. So 13 years passed between Verse 16 of chapter 16 and verse 1 of chapter 17. So think about, for 13 years, Ishmael grows up and Abram thinks this, this is a promised child. This, Sarah's plan worked. For 13 more years, Sarah is barren, thinking, I am the problem. I am the obstacle and I guess I, I had to give him Hagar. For 13 years, Abram and Sarah are left to think that this is the promised child. This is the one through whom these promises then are going to be passed on to and fulfilled through but God clearly has a different plan. And then notice when God appears to Abraham, he he first addresses Abraham, reminding Abram who it is that's speaking to him. He says, I am God Almighty. This is the first time in the Bible that God refers to them by the, the name El Shaddai, Almighty God. And every time this name shows up in Scripture, especially in Genesis, it's usually associated with a with someone who's barren. So uh, God refers to himself as El Shaddai when Jacob is looking for a wife to have children. And then here with Abram, he shows up and says, I'm El Shaddai, I am Almighty God. He's identifying himself as the one who possesses all power, whom no obstacle is too big to overcome to fulfill his promises. And then after identifying himself as God Almighty, he gives this command with a purpose attached to it to Abram. He says, walk before me, Abram, and be blameless so that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So he dresses Abram and gives him a command. And there's actually kind of a compatibility issue between Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 here. Because in Genesis 15, there was no command given to Abram. And the ceremony that God performed made it seem like God's promises and purposes to Abram will be unconditionally fulfilled. And Abraham just has trust in God to fulfill it. But in Genesis 17, he makes it sound like, you need to do this. You need to walk before me and be blameless so that I may make my covenant with you. So it seems like there's conditions now attached in Genesis 17. So what, what gives? What's the connection? How can we make these compatible? And I believe that by calling Abram to walk before him and be blameless, God is not saying now, hey, you better earn your right to these promises or else I'm going to cast you off. Rather, God has clearly in Genesis 15 already guaranteed his promises to Abram out of sheer grace. And now with this command, he's merely calling Abram to live a life that's worthy of the grace that's already been freely offered to him. He's merely calling Abram to live in light of the promises that have already been guaranteed to him. I mean, even in the New Testament, this idea of walk before God is one of the main ways we're called to live as Christians in light of what Christ has done for us. That Paul in Ephesians, 
after chapters 1 through 3, which is all about the gospel glories that we've been given in Christ, starts chapter 4 with saying, now walk in a manner worthy of your calling. That it's merely a response, a worshipful response to the blessings we've been given, not a means to earn God's favor, to maintain his grace. So keep that in mind when we're looking at that command. And then after this command is given, Abram responds in verse 3 by falling on his face before the Lord. And this is just a physical gesture from Abram that signifies to God that he submits to him and that he worships him. It's a, it's a way that you know, words can't express what you can do with laying on your face before the Lord, that he submits to him and he reverences him. And as we move to verses 4 to 6, God again restates his promises to Abram, but this time they're expanded and revealed to be even more massive than what we've seen in Genesis 12 or Genesis 15. So read along in verses 4 to 6 with me. It says, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. A multitude of nations. Well, remember in Genesis 12 too, the original promise given to Abram was that you would be a great nation in the singular. But now God is showing, it's, I'm, I'm going bigger than that. This is, he's starting to peel back the layers on how global his plan is going to be by saying to Abram that not only are you going to be a great nation, which you will, but I'm actually going to make you a multitude of nations. And then in verse 5, God changes Abram's name to reflect these promises. And this is actually the first time that Abram is called Abraham, what we typically refer to Abraham as. So God says in verse 5, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. So Abraham is now his new God-given name. That literally means the father of a multitude, the father of a multitude. And it's important to note that biblically, whenever someone is given a new name by God, it's always corresponding to the destiny that they have in God's plan and his purpose. So when Jacob's changed to Israel, it's because Jacob is going to be the father of the 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of the Israelites. And even when Saul is changed to Paul, it corresponds to his purpose to be the one to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. So biblically, when a name is changed, it always signifies a special role they'll play in God's plan of redemption. And what's also interesting is that in the second half of verse 5, God gives the reason for changing Abraham's name. And listen to the tense of the verb. Okay, I'm going to get a little nerdy on you here, but listen to the tense of the verb when he speaks why he's changed his name. He says, For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I have made you. How can God speak in present tense when Abraham is childless? And I think God can speak in the present tense without being called you know, a liar or a misleader because God's faithfulness is so dependable. His promises are so sure that God can speak in the present tense of his promises because it's as if they're already fulfilled that when we look at the promises in Scripture, the reason we can claim them now and hold on to them now and not wonder if they'll be fulfilled is because it's God who makes the promises. Someone's promises are only good as the person making them, right? And it's God speaking here. I have made you. I'm going to make you a multitude of nations. And when I change your name, I'm telling you, I have made you a multitude of nations. And this actually shows up all over the New Testament that when speaking to Christians, We can speak to Christians as if future things are already happening because of how secure we are in Christ. That in Romans 8, Paul can say to Christians that God whom justified us has also glorified us. And what does glorifying refer to? Well, that refers to a future reality. That refers to getting a new body, getting a new home, a new heavens, a new earth, that this curse would be overcome. And the curse in us and the curse in the world. And yet, Paul speaks of it in the present tense, that you're glorified. And why is that? And Paul goes on in Romans 8 to say that I can speak in the present tense of your future because nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Death or sorrow or pain or suffering, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's why I speak in the present tense. And that's why God does it here because the promises are secure because of the person making the promises. So moving to verse 6. God once again expands the promises 
to Abraham. So not only just a great nation and a multitude of nations, but he adds even more here. He says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. So he's telling Abraham, you're going to be the father, not just of a royal kingdom, but you're going to be a father of a royal world, that kings, all the kings will come from you. And what's interesting to note here is that the language that God is using to describe his promises to Abram, Abraham in Genesis 17 echoes back to things that were earlier spoken of in Genesis. These words, fruitful, multiply, what do those remind us of? Well, Genesis 1.28, the first command given to the first human couple, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And then when Noah got off the boat and was recommissioned, what was he recommissioned to do? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But the difference here is Genesis 1.28, Genesis 9.7, it's a command. How did they do in fulfilling that command in Genesis 1 and Genesis 9? Well, they failed. They sinned. They dishonored the command that God had given them. They dishonored the God who had given them the command. But here to Abram, it's not in the form of a command. It's in the form of a promise. That God, whose original design and creation was to fill the earth with his image, that his glory might cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, is now promising that through Abraham, I'm going to multiply you, make you fruitful, that the earth will be filled with my glory. And because God changes it from command to promise, we know it will be fulfilled. And that's why we have end times promises, like Habakkuk 2.14, that says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What was a command in the beginning was broken, is now promised, and what we see in the end will be fulfilled. So now as we move to verses 7 to 8, I want to walk us through this section by asking the question I mentioned at the beginning. What is a covenant? What is a covenant? And this word keeps showing up, shows up 13 times in Genesis 17, over 260 times in the Old Testament, and it becomes very, very important in the New Testament when we hear this word new attached to the word covenant. So what is a covenant? Well, let me give you Five components of what make up a biblical covenant. And in the Bible, there's, there's many different types of covenants, but the most significant ones, and the one I'm going to focus on, is a covenant made between God and mankind. Divine human covenants. And there's five components that make up a divine human covenant. And first, at the heart of a covenant is relationship. And it's captured in this statement where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people, which shows up all over scripture. The heart of covenant is relationship. I will be your God and you will be my people. I mean, look at verse, the end of verse 7 where God uses words similar to this. He says, he promises to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And again, at the end of verse 8, he promises to Abraham's offspring that he says, I will be their God. So in all the major covenants in the Bible, we need to remember that it's abundantly clear that it's God the, is the one initiating the relationship with man. It's never a game of hide and seek with God where man is trying to find God and hope, hopefully start a relationship with him. No, no, it's, it's running and finding. Man is running away and God is finding man and making a covenant relationship with them. So the first component of, rela- of covenant is relationship. Second component is that of promises. That covenants always include promises made from one party to another. And the promise is always made from the greater party to the lesser. And clearly, in in this case, it's God who makes the promises to man. Like, look at all the the verbs, the the statements in verses 5 through 8. And notice who's the subject and who's the object. Verse 5, I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you. And then verse 8, I will give to you the land of your sojournings. At the end of verse 8, I will be their God. It's clearly that man is the beneficiary in the covenant relationships in Scripture and that God is a benefactor. God is the one making and swearing the promises and man is the recipient of these glorious promises. So relationship, promises. And the third component of covenant is a pledge of loyalty. A pledge of loyalty. So this pledge of loyalty is made to the one who makes the promises. So the one who receives the promises says to the promise maker, I pledge my loyalty to you. So this is where we as humans 
would say to God, yes, we will be your people and you are our God. And this pledge of loyalty is captured by the command that God gave to Abram in Genesis 17 too. Walk before me and be blameless. Respond appropriately to my covenant grace and promises to you. And in verse 9, the whole section from 9 to 14 is about Abraham's response in, in this covenant relationship. He says in verse 9, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout your generations. So when it comes to covenant relationship with God, don't mix up pledge of loyalty with trying to earn or maintain the favor of the covenant maker. No, we aren't loyal so that God will love us. It's quite the opposite. We are loyal because God has loved us. It would be silly to live our lives trying to earn something from God in a covenant relationship with him that he's already freely offered to us in his son. So remember, pledge of loyalty is just the worshipful response to the grace that is given and and bestowed on us by God. So relationship, promises, pledge of loyalty. Fourth one, consequences. Consequences. Now, as a young and growing up, consequences always meant something negative. But I've come to see that consequences is a neutral word. It can mean positive or negative. So understand that, that consequences, when it comes to covenant consequences, there's positive and negative. And these are captured by the words that show up in the Bible, blessing and curse. Blessing and curse. That for honoring the, the covenant relationship, there's blessing held out. And for rebelling and rejecting the covenant and the covenant God, there is curse held out. And look at the end of uh, Genesis seventeen fourteen. We, we see this idea of the covenant curse being brought up here. It says, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And then the last component of a covenant, we have relationship promises, pledge of loyalty, consequences, and then finally, a sign, a covenant sign or symbol. And these signs that are given are always meant to function as a reminder of the covenant relationship that's been established. So we're going to see in the next section of Genesis 17 that God gives Abraham a covenant sign and one that we as 21st century Christians find rather odd, but it's the covenant sign nonetheless, so we'll get there. But in, in Genesis 9, when God forms a covenant with Noah and with creation, he, he puts a rainbow in the sky to signify the covenant relationship. And later in Exodus, in Exodus 31, God says that the Sabbath day, Seventh day of the week should be a day set aside holy to the Lord as a sign of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. And as Christians in the new covenant, we, have, we celebrate two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism reminds us of the covenant relationship and the Lord's Supper reminds us of the covenant relationship that we have with God. So to put these components together, a covenant is a God-initiated relationship where God makes promises to his people and his people pledge their loyalty to him lest they, you know, so that they might suffer the blessings rather than the curses, the consequences. And these are memorialized by a sign of the covenant relationship. And what is the best example we have today of a covenant? It's marriage. The covenant that God established in Genesis 2. That marriage is placed in creation by God so that we can be reminded of what it means when he says that he is a covenant God, that he forms a covenant relationship with us. I mean, think about it. In a wedding ceremony, a relationship is being formed where you say, I am your husband and you are my wife. And that there's an exchanging of vows where you make promises and pledges, where you say, you know, I promise um, to love you and to hold you and you know, all these things that we never quite fully measure up to, um, but we try our best nonetheless. And then there's pledges of loyalty where I pledge my you know, undying love to you and my faithfulness to you to be yours and yours alone. So there's promises and pledges of loyalty. And then after the exchanging of vows, what's given? A ring is given to be placed on a finger to remind them that you have sworn a covenant oath to this person that you've now just established a relationship with. So marriage is given and albeit in this sinful world, not a perfect example, but an example nonetheless of what it means when God forms a covenant relationship with us. So now transitioning to verses 9 through 14, the last section we'll cover in this, in this sermon. 
And in verses 9 through 11, God tells Abraham what the sign of the covenant will be. He says, every male among you, this is verse 10, shall be circumcised. Verse 11, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. So that's what the sign is. And then verses 12 through 13, it says who the sign should specifically be applied to. And then in verse 14, he tells him what the consequence is for not honoring the terms of this covenant, saying you shall be cut off from his people if he does not take on the sign. Now just to pause and give a disclaimer, in case you're worried about how I'm going to approach this, I can assure you that I'll keep my comments biblical and theological and I'll avoid the medical comments. I'm not a doctor, so I don't really know what to say about this. Um, And also, in case you're wondering, no pictures or diagrams will be employed in the preaching of the sermon (laughs) either. Thank you. I figure, you know, I'm 25. I might as well get a laugh out of them while I can. So now to be serious. So why this covenant sign? Why this covenant sign? I mean, let's be honest. Who hasn't read Genesis 17 and said, what is he doing here? Why give this sign? And so I want to try and answer that question for you. I want to propose that every time a sign is given, it is significant, and we should ask the question, what does it symbolize? And I want to give you four answers to what circumcision signified for the people of Israel. And remember how I said there are five components of a covenant. The fifth one was a sign. Well, guess what? I believe this sign of the covenant that God makes with Abraham corresponds to each one of the other four components of a covenant, that it corresponds to the relationship, the promises, the pledge of loyalty, and the consequences. And I'm going to try to draw that out for you. So first, the covenant sign of circumcision signified for Israel the covenant relationship. How did it do this? Well, it did this by giving them a marker that set them off from the nations around them. Every time this ceremony was performed or someone saw the sign, it signified for them that they were God's people and he was their God. I mean, remember, when they went to battle against people like the Philistines, how did they derogatorily refer to the Philistines? As uncircumcised Philistines. Because unlike Israel, they didn't have a relationship with Yahweh God. They were marked for a covenant with God. So it signified the relationship, the special relationship they had by having the special sign. But what's important to know is that this sign was never meant to become a source of nationalistic pride, which unfortunately throughout the history of Israel it did. And you see in the New Testament that even in Galatians when Paul is fighting with Israelites to let the Gentiles in, they're saying, no, no, they have to be circumcised. If they're really going to be allowed to have faith in Jesus, they need to be circumcised. Because there's this sense of nationalistic pride that they thought, they thought because we have this sign, we are God's special people. Yes, they're special, but not because they make this sign. They're special because God loved them and chose them. Listen to Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, when Moses describes to Israel why God chose them as a special people. He says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasure possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And that sounds privileged and special. Well, here's why, verse 7 of Deuteronomy 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. In fact, you weren't even a people when I chose Abraham. I mean, the Israelites didn't happen until later in Genesis. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the covenant promises that he swore to your fathers. When God redeemed Israel from Egypt and their slavery there, it wasn't because they deserved it or because he owed them something. No, he was just keeping his promise to Abraham by grace. So the covenant sign was meant to remind them of the special relationship they had by grace with God. Second, the covenant sign of circumcision signified the covenant promises. It reminded Israel of the promises that God had made to Abraham. What was the promises? To multiply you, make you fruitful, to give you offspring. So by using this instrument of the male to use the sign, it was reminding them of the promises to pass on seed and offspring to his people. But it needs to be noted that this promise of offspring, this is not the first time a promise of offspring has been made. Not in Genesis 15, not in Genesis 12, but even earlier than that. There was a promise of offspring that actually stands behind the promise of offspring to Abraham that's even more significant. Listen to Genesis 3.15 with me. God speaking to the serpent who has brought sin into the world says this, 
I will put war between you, serpent, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, a single male offspring that will come from the woman, will crush your head, serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. So the first time offspring is mentioned in the Bible, it's Genesis 3.15, and it's associated with a single male offspring that's supposed to come from the woman. So behind the promise of many offspring, there also stands this one offspring. That Genesis is helping us to long for a serpent crusher, one who would destroy who we know as Satan, and one who would overthrow the curse that has been brought because of Satan's devious ways. So behind the promise of offspring, we wait for a serpent crusher and a curse overthrower. And covenant, the covenant sign of circumcision helps us remember the promise for the many and the one. Third, covenant sign of circumcision signified the covenant pledge of loyalty. The covenant pledge of loyalty. By performing this act, circumcision, you are in a sense consecrating yourself to the Lord or consecrating your children to the Lord, saying that we are in a special relationship with God and that we owe him our loyalty because of his grace. And this is why later in the Old Testament, this idea for circumcision isn't just used with the physical sign, but it actually is used to speak of the heart. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Don't just consecrate yourself physically to me, but you need to be consecrated in your heart spiritually to me. Jeremiah 4, 4, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskins of your heart, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. That Israel wasn't meant to just take on a physical sign, but they're meant to give God an inward spiritual reality, that the physical sign pointed to that inward spirituality of not just a physical consecration to the Lord, but yourself consecrated to the Lord in obedience to this covenant relationship. So it signifies the relationship, the promise, the pledge of loyalty. And finally, the covenant sign of circumcision signified the curse of the covenant. In Genesis 17, 14, there's intentional irony at play with the procedure of circumcision and then the consequence for not performing it. Because he says this, he says, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And the irony comes when you understand that to perform physical circumcision, it requires a cutting off. And yet God is saying, if you do not perform this cutting off, you'll be cut off from my people because you have broken my covenant. So in light of what circumcision signified, it's important to note that the Old Testament is a story of how Israel failed to actually experience the reality of what the sign pointed to. That Israel is a nation that started to look more like their uncircumcised neighbors than they were meant to look like God's people. That they started to worship the false gods of their uncircumcised neighbors. And listen to what the judgment that God pronounces on Israel before he sends them into exile through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. And then verse 26, all the house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. So to merely take on the physical sign without the inward spirituality meant absolutely nothing. It was actually more judgment upon your head to take on the physical sign, to know the God of the covenant, and to break it by living in rebellion and disobedience to him and, to worship, and chasing after other gods. So the question we're asking when we turn the pages of the Old Testament to the New Testament is, what is the real problem with Israel and how is God going to solve it? And it actually points to what our real problem is and how God solves ours. That, as one pastor said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. That you can be, you can be uh, you know, physically consecrated to the Lord, you can practice all the rituals you want, but it will not change your heart because our heart is dead. Our heart is cursed just along with this world. That sin isn't a problem out there or sin isn't just something we do. Sinners are something we are because our hearts are corrupted by sin. So when we turn the pages of the Old Testament to the New, we ask, how is God going to solve this problem? Enter onto the scene of the story of redemption, a child. Luke 2.21 tells us that this child was no ordinary child. At eight days old, this child is circumcised and he's called by a God-given name for the first time. 
What's that name? Jesus. That the first time Joseph and Mary called Jesus by the name that was spoken to them is that his circumcision on eight days old. What does the name of Jesus mean? Well, literally, Jesus means Yahweh saves. Yahweh, the covenant God, the relational God who wants a covenant with his people, sends his son, Jesus, Yahweh saves, to be the one through whom we can enter into a covenant with him. And Matthew 121 tells us specifically why Jesus has given this name, Yahweh saves. Because he will save his people from their sins. The thing that separates us from a covenant relationship with God, our sin, was come to be dealt with by God's own son, Jesus, Yahweh saves. And what was the culminating act of Jesus' life through which our sins were dealt with and through which we could enter into relationship with God? It's the cross, the cross of Christ. And listen to what Paul describes the cross and death of Christ as. Colossians 2, 11 says this, In Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh. How? By the circumcision of Christ. So Paul looks at the cross of Jesus Christ and he calls it a circumcision. Well, why does he call it a circumcision? Well, remember what circumcision signifies. The last thing that circumcision signified was the curse of the covenant. That to break the covenant brought curses. Well, who bore the curses of the broken covenant? Jesus. In his death on the cross, he became a curse for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? So that we as sinners could enter into a covenant relationship with God. That he experiences all the curse of the covenant so we can experience all the blessings of the covenant. Which is why Paul says in Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be our God and Father who has blessed us in Christ with every what? Every spiritual blessing. That we receive all the blessings of the covenant. In who? In Christ. Why? Because he experienced a cutting off on the cross. He experienced the judgment of the covenant on the cross. So when you think of the word covenant, remember the word new covenant, a new covenant we have through Christ, where we have a relationship, where we can call God our Father. We can cry out, Abba, Father, because he calls us his children. In the new covenant, we've been given the promises that are captured so well in Revelation 21, 3, and 4. And I heard a loud voice crying from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be crying or mourning or pain, for the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. We have a new covenant with a new father and a new family. And it's not just eternal life, but it's eternal fellowship with God that we get to live in. And in light of this grace toward us and the new covenant through Christ to cut off on the cross so we could be brought in and experience blessing, not curse, how can we not respond but to live lives of gratefulness to God and worship and obedience and faith and repentance? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you're a covenant God who pursues rebels like us, that you would send your son to bear the curse so that we could be recipients of the blessing, that he would become sin even though we were sinners, so that we, those sinners, could be treated like your son and called your children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.